Hi, I'm Bryce Crittenden. Hi, I'm Caroline Land, and welcome back to EPL's Overdue Finds. Hey, Caroline, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, Bryce? Good, good. It's been a busy last couple of weeks for us, hasn't it? Absolutely. I was. We were just talking before we hit record, which I know podcasters say you should never do, capture it all on air. But uh, yeah, we were just talking about how it, once we hit summer with all the stuff that comes with it, the kids summer reading club, the adult summer reading club, back to school, fall, the gala coming up, tons of things happening going on we can't believe it's already this time of year yeah and i mean one of the cool things about the fall that i love is and i mean i caroline yeah you're you know you're like me we we love our movies and i think you could agree with this when i when i say this but The fall is one of the best times for movies because we're getting all these like prestige pictures coming out, like all these big Oscar kind of bait movies where the studios are like, these are our best movies and we want them to be up for, for reward for, sorry, awards. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just a really fun time of the year. And I know a lot of people love the summer movies. I'm more of a fan of like the fall movies. I think as, as I get older, more of the serious pictures, but with movies, I mean, uh, you know, you can watch a movie and kind of be like invested in it for two hours or so. And sometimes depending on how that ending sticks, it can ruin the whole thing. Absolutely. And it's kind of this fine art. And I mean, really, this kind of applies to books, TV shows, everything. But like the ending for, you know, movies, anything else is so important. And that's today. And that's what we're actually going to be talking all about today. Uh, We're going to be sharing our picks for the best and worst movie endings. Uh, Longtime listeners, you may remember last year, actually was, uh, I believe, June of uh, 2022 it was episode 110 we talked about the best and worst tv finales uh this is a topic for some reason it's took it taken us over a year to come back to but uh here we are finally we have had this on the list for the while when we asked staff originally if you listen to the best and worst tv finales episode we gathered lots of ideas from all of the great staff who work here at epl and uh we got lots of ideas about tv movies books uh even video games on there and when i sat down to write the outline i messaged you and was and said bryce this is we got to break this up otherwise this is going <laughs> to be a six hour podcast record so we're going to do the six hours just over a period of time but we had no idea it would be this long really to get to it but here we are yeah and obviously yeah today we're talking about movies but you know for future episodes hopefully it's not a year from now maybe in a month or two uh early 2024 we will finally do our best and worst book endings uh episode so today though all about movies it's just caroline and i and uh, we're gonna be sharing some picks from staff and our own personal picks caroline i'm really excited to hear what you've got um i have some kind of controversial picks on mine but uh we'll we'll get into it here in a little bit uh before we get into our overdue finds picks though I want to remind everybody that tickets for our next Forward Thinking Speaker Series event are now on sale. You won't want to miss Brian Stevenson, Confronting Injustice, presented by Edmonton Community Foundation on October 3rd at the Chateau Lacombe Hotel. Brian Stevenson is the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, which has won major legal challenges eliminating excessive and unfair sentencing in the U.S., During this presentation, the Just Mercy author will share what people can do to get close to and improve social justice issues in their own communities. Tickets are only $10 each and are available on eventbrite.ca or visit our website at epl.ca slash speaker dash series for more information. Uh, Caroline, I was just looking at ticket sales here this morning before we hit record. We have under 100 tickets left. So when you're listening to this, if you're on the fence about going, 
Go check it out. Uh, the money from the ticket sales goes to our Ready, Set, Read program, uh, which helps uh, children get uh, one free book a, a month until the age of five. It's a great program. So, uh, yeah, you, you help a good cause, and you get to see an amazing speaker in Brian Stevenson. Yeah, it should be a great night. Mm-hmm. All right, Caroline, uh, it seems like it's been a long time since we've actually recorded an episode. Um, I was away for a week or so, and uh, yeah, so what have you been enjoying since our last recording? Well, I knew we were going to talk all about movies, so (laughs) I tried to be a little different today, and I actually have a music pick, uh, but I'm going to start by talking about a movie. Uh, (laughs) I recently watched the Wham! documentary that is on Netflix. Uh, We don't have that in our collection because it is just released streaming on Netflix, but we do have a lot of historical Wham! items in the collection including Andrew Ridgely's uh, memoir of the of the time period which I think has to have been heavily influential in the crafting of the documentary Wham! of course being the British uh, music duo uh, from the early 80s and as I was watching the documentary I get into it and I'm thinking wow Wham! had so many more songs than you remember and then I watch a little bit more and then I think to myself oh no they really didn't they it (laughs) it really is just the the big hit so that actually sent me going down for some of their earlier stuff which I was not as familiar with as some of the bigger hits like Careless Whisper which is George Michael featuring Wham which is an interesting (laughs) thing that they cover in there Wake Me Up Before You Go Go uh, Last Christmas being the biggest probably there and then George Michael's solo stuff but the their debut album fantastic we have in our collection and uh, if you like me need to brush up a little bit on your wham history your early 80s music knowledge I definitely recommend checking it out nice I saw th- I haven't watched the documentary yet I saw it uh, was new on netflix and added it to my ever growing to watch list i know it's so long (laughs) i know i'm like i'm never gonna watch all of this (laughs) stuff but it's just nice to have um yeah i that's actually a great pick i know that um yeah i love the kind of some of those synth sounds from the from the early 80s and uh kind of got me thinking too like uh like when you mentioned wham the first song i thought of was last christmas and i you know, if uh, if I was a musician, I think I'd try and get like a catchy Christmas song because they probably make more than enough money just off the royalties from that song alone to uh, probably sustain a pretty nice living for the rest of their uh, for you know the people who produced it. Yeah, it, it the the documentary it goes that there's there's last Christmas is you know this interesting story and like the, the, they talk about the filming of like the music video for it which is in like the european alps in this like ski cabin <laughs> and it's just great and uh it was going up the charts and the the uk christmas single is such a big deal and the year that it came out it was actually behind uh one of like the super group uh the do they know it's christmas which held it off at number one spoiler alert for 80s (laughs) band uh sound track listings um which George Michael was also on, but it was this, you know, professional kind of disappointment for them. Just the dynamic, too, between, like, two friends. So you start, and this is, you know, George Michael died a few years ago, so he, it's archival footage in the documentary, but they do talk with Andrew Ridgely and he you know this experience of you start a band with a good friend or you start a a a performing singing group with with a good friend and you just want to kind of hang out and have fun and then you quickly discover that the other guy is one of the best songwriters in the world and how do you handle that? How do you um, deal with that personally, professionally, uh, reconciling kind of where you're going with where they're going? It's just really interesting on a lot of ways. And the music is just super catchy. Yeah, that's, yeah, that sounds great. And I know that um, 
uh, even to it, uh, you know, Andrew Ridgely, I imagine that's got to be, and I'm sure he, they touch on it in the documentary and other stuff that maybe he's written or whatever, but it's got to be kind of odd for going forward for the rest of his life. He's just probably known as the other guy from Wham. Yeah. Right. Like every, everybody knows who George Michael is, but if you put up a picture of him, yeah. nine out of 10 people, probably even 10 out of 10 people probably wouldn't know his name. Yeah, so uh, check out the music. There are items in the collection if you want to read up from uh, more of the historical period. But yeah, get to know some of the the other hits of Wham. Uh, So what's uh, your overdue find, Bray? So I'm cheating a little bit on my overdue find pick this week. Um, I did as I was traveling last week. So I watched a lot of movies on a plane. So I'll give some picks later. But as you mentioned, we're chatting all about movies today. So I'll save those picks for another episode. So my pick here this week, it's kind of a repeat pick. And I, I'll tell you why. Um, when it, we talked about it being fall and it's awesome. We both love it. New movies uh, coming out. Um, but... For me personally, I love the fall because that means we're so close to the start of the hockey season. And for those people out there like myself who are in fantasy hockey leagues, I know there are a lot of you out there. Uh, For me, I love it because uh, that means we're going to be hosting our drafts and getting ready for the start of the NHL season, picking up uh, drafting our fantasy hockey team so my pick this week actually is uh i you know for those people who are in fantasy hockey leagues i recommend checking out the hockey news 2023-2024 fantasy hockey guide which you can get instantly for free while using libby so uh, if you're not familiar with libby libby's an app that uh, we have through the library basically you sign in with your library card and you can get access to ebooks audiobooks and magazines as well so um we actually have a fairly large magazine collection on there um what i like about the guide this is something that I personally have been using for probably close to 20 years uh, that since I've been playing fantasy hockey anyway. This gives you uh, projections for all the teams. Maybe you learn about some rookies who are coming up for other teams other than the Oilers. It's it, You know, living in Edmonton, it's very easy just to get Edmonton Oilers information. But if you need to know who's coming up for like the New Jersey Devils or the Nashville Predators, teams you don't hear about as often here... Um, the hockey, the fantasy hockey guide from the hockey news is, is the way to go. So Caroline, actually a few, I was looking back on my list of overdue fine picks recommendations in one of our very early episodes that the start of that hockey season, that was my overdue fines pick. But, uh, yeah, today I just more so wanted to remind everybody, save your $10, at the newsstand you can download it uh automatically on your computer look at it there on your phone so you're all ready to go on uh fan- hockey fantasy draft day so even if you're not uh in a fantasy hockey league and you know somebody who is uh let them know about that so yeah you mentioned uh being in edmonton we often hear a lot about the oilers or there might be teams that we don't know i've been playing online the game uh Puck Doku, uh, oh, which okay, yeah. is uh, kind of like the um, Immaculate Grid Sudoku style of you have to match up certain criteria. And there are some days, uh, you know, if, if Edmonton and Calgary are in a line, I'm doing well that day. And then there are days where I look at it and it's like, I've never even heard of this team. So <laughs> I will not uh, be scoring very well today. So, yeah, I could, I should be reading the hockey news. You should. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, my friends and I, we have a whole separate like puck doku uh, WhatsApp chat where we share our scores every day. And it's funny because this morning when we're recording it, there's a couple teams where I always get thrown off on. And one of them is the New Jersey Devils and uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets. So both are heavily featured today. And I've got my grid about halfway filled and I'll go back to it later, maybe this evening uh, after I've had some time to think about players. But yeah, very, very fun game though. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so today, of course, we are chatting all about the best and worst 
movie endings. Um, yeah, Caroline, I'm so looking forward to uh, chatting about some of these and especially getting uh, your picks for some of the best and worst ones. Uh, but before we get into it, though, I've got to ask you, what do you think are some of the elements of a good ending? And I think this is kind of tied into a little bit, but uh, how do you feel about the post credit scenes? They definitely kind of took on a life of their own uh, for a while, uh, didn't they? During the, I guess, post-Avengers Marvel mm-hmm. era. Um, I I like post-credit scenes uh, or inter-credit scenes. Sometimes you see them midway through or during... Um, like they'll be on screen and the credits will be going next to them. I think of like Austin Powers doing that Mm. uh, back in the day. Uh, I like them. And I think it, you know, without getting too philosophical too early in the podcast, I think it raises the question of when is the movie over? You know, when we're talking about a film, um, is it the last scene before it, fades to black or does something is it uh during the credits you know again um often there's a song or something happening during the credits that continues it is it um it is essential that you have to that you have to there i go with my point of view maybe uh that you have to sit and watch the credits um on there so i think uh i like them i've been i've been in the theater like googling does this have a post credit scene because it definitely for a while there especially thinking of the marvel series um like plot points would be released and i don't think i like that as much i like kind of the fun moment or doing something with the characters more so than an important plot point coming out but maybe i just need to expand my view of when the movie ends yeah there's actually an app i have it on my phone every time i go to a movie i open it up it's called after credits and basically you type in the movie and it'll tell you uh whether or not there is a post credit scene and uh either it'll tell you whether or not there's one during the credits or post credits and also uh it'll tell you kind of whether or not it's worth sticking around for so um people can vote on that so a little handy tool for you and our listeners uh out there just in case you also find yourself googling uh (laughs) post credit uh, scene movies when you go to them um yeah i agree it's um i like i like kind of like the little like nods or jokes kind of thrown in at the end like one of my favorite ones and this is like long before obviously like all the marvel movies have been coming out but you go back to 1986's ferris bueller's day off um where the credits roll and they do also have the post credit scene of course with uh ed rooney on, on the bus and everything trying to get back to the school but uh the post credit scene of course you have ferris bueller come out and uh he's it's like he's just gotten out of the shower or something and he's like what are you doing here like the movie's over go yeah. home yeah so that's like easily one of probably one of the first ones and one of the best uh post credit scenes um an example of that but i like stuff like that versus like you say you go to a marvel movie i know during um the first iron man movie uh, it ends and then like of course you sit through all the credits and then we have nick fury basically mentioning about the uh avengers to tony stark and it's kind of like ooh, like this is going to happen in a in a future movie like put that in the actual movie like yeah um yeah i kind of like the idea of some of like more of the lighter stuff being thrown at the um during during those uh post credit scenes anyway but you know as far as like movie endings go obviously you know you like to have something wrapped up perfectly in a nice little package hopefully there's not too many questions about what happened to that character or what about this guy so you know stuff like that i think is so important to um uh, to an ending and then we're, what we're going to probably be talking about i know i've got a few in mind of course like the twist endings is that something where you know you you come out of a movie and you're like oh my god like you have to go and see this um i can't tell you about it 
uh, but you have to go check it out. Uh, one of my favorite all time scenes from the Simpsons is when, uh, Homer and Marge, it shows them in the early eighties and they're dating and they're leaving the empire strikes back <laughs> and, and they're walking past the lineup of people waiting to get in. And, uh, Homer's like, wow, I can't believe Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father. And of course everybody just gets, gets mad at him. So, uh, spoiler alert, by the way. So just in case you've never seen empire strikes back or many of these movies you know yeah. like we are literally going to be talking about the end of movies for the rest of the podcast so pretty much yeah yeah i think i i also had that twist ending on there and i think for me what a like a successful a good ending for a movie is either like bringing a sense of satisfaction in re- in resolving or um bringing the story to a to a close um i think that i have talked on the podcast about um my reaction to the first lord of the rings movie when uh i like literally said stood up in a theater and said that's it um (laughs) and you know it if to me it didn't stand on its own maybe if i went back with perspective and um you know kate gibson's uh support in watching it uh i would feel i might feel differently but i wasn't satisfied by it, it you know it um so that also i think comes into play with the twist ending uh and that was what was coming up when I was doing the research for this episode around, you know, the best movie endings of all time, a lot of them really focused on the twist, the thing mm-hmm. that grabs you, shakes you. And I, I love a twist ending. I'm here for it. It needs to make sense. Like yeah. it needs to hang together. It needs to be true to what has come before it, even if it, you know, is contradictory or um, makes you think of characters in a different way or does something that changes how you've understood everything. It needs, there needs to be that consistency around what was put down in the movie for that to come next i don't know do you feel the same way yeah no i i totally agree there's uh we're going to talk when we get into talking about our least favorite endings there's one movie in particular i just found out about uh last week and about the ending for it and it's a twist ending but it's just like so unnecessary and it just kind of ruins the rest of the movie um so i'll share that here in a little bit but no i agree like it's got to make sense for the story not just uh kind of like uh you know m night Shyamalan, of course is kind of known for his you know for the twist endings and you know these these big reveals or swerves or whatever um yeah it definitely has to make sense for the story and not just uh you know boom like yeah. what you've been watching this whole time has been a lie like yeah thanks. so yeah Uh, We asked staff to share their picks, as I mentioned, for some of the most memorable movie endings. And we received received some final line recommendations from two very different movies. One was The Lost Boys, uh, which is a movie I just saw for the first time in the last year. Oh, nice. So that was uh, new to me. And Some Like It Hot, which I know you've talked about on the podcast, Bryce, uh, and the line from Some Like It Hot, you know, the, well, nobody's perfect, is probably <laughs> one of, if not the most famous last line in movie history. What are some of your favorite memorable final lines from a movie? Yeah, I was going to say quickly, the Some Like It Hot line, uh, well, nobody's perfect. Uh, so the actor says that uh, Joe E. Brown, apparently he has that written on his tombstone. <laughs> um, I was reading about that last night. So I, th- I thought that was really cool. And the Lost Boys one is is really funny as well, because, um, you know, we have this big like finale, this big, you know, fight scene with all these vampires and the grandpa walks into the kitchen you know, grabs a root beer from the fridge and just basically says that one thing about living in Santa Carla, I could never stomach all the damn vampires. So he knew about the vampires all along. It didn't tell us, you know, didn't think it was too important to tell his family about it. So I thought that was really funny. Um, But yeah, as far as like some of the, um, in my opinion, like some of those like best um, final lines in a movie, um, first one that came to my mind of course is back to the future where 
um, Marty and Doc Brown are in the DeLorean and uh, Marty's like, you know, they're going to go to the future. But Marty's like, I don't think we've got enough room here, Doc. And he's like, roads, where we're going, we don't need roads. And of course, the DeLorean uh, floats up in the air and they, they fly off into the future. So that, that, of course, is really cool and sets up a sequel. One of the funny ones, too, of course, is also from uh, Silence, Silence of the Lambs. At the end of the movie, we have uh, Hannibal Lecter, played perfectly by Anthony Hopkins. He's on the phone talking to uh, Jodie Foster's uh, character, uh, Clarice Starling. And he's like, I do wish we could chat longer, but I'm having an old friend for dinner as he's uh, stalking... Uh, one of the psychiatrists that um, from when he was in prison. So that's such a, I mean, great line to, to end that movie and kind of leave you also. And that's all, that's the other thing too. Sometimes it's great just leaving you, you know, wanting more as, as a viewer, like you're like, Oh my God, like I wish this movie kept going for another two hours to find out what happens. So uh, sense of the lambs is definitely one of those ones anyway. Um, And then as far as kind of like, you know, not as it's not funny, but one that kind of just hits you in the feels is um, is from a movie that we talked about actually a couple of years ago, Stand by Me. Um, at the end, of course, we've got uh, Gordy, who as an adult is played by Richard Dreyfus, and he's kind of writing his his book and everything on the computer, and he's he's reminiscing about his uh, his you know his his childhood friends. And the final line of the movie is, "I never had any friends later on like the ones I had when I was twelve. Jesus, does anyone? Which is uh, yeah, just hits you in the feels and definitely makes you kind of look back at some of your own friends when you were at that age. And it's uh, yeah, it's such a true line. Yeah, I think the the ones that stood out to me were really character based like the one like um like the silence of the lambs like you said or uh jeremy irons and reversal of fortune you know having like the captivating presence on screen as klaus von bulow and just kind of owning that last scene the last lines of it even though with a completely different than these screen villains uh, i can see that as stand by me as well having uh these these strong kind of character perspectives on it the one that came to mind for me is a totally depart is like totally different um thing but it's one of my favorite lines and i quote it a surprising amount of times um are you familiar with a little movie called sister act two back in the habit <laughs> Came out in the early 90s, starring Whoopi Goldberg as Sister Mary Clarence. I am familiar with it. I have not had the pleasure of watching it, but I do know we joked around before about uh, doing a deep dive episode on Sister Act 2. Yes. Is it uh, Sister Act 2 back in the habit? Yeah. Yes. So there's Sister yeah. Act, the original, where <laughs> uh, Whoopi Goldberg as as Dolores Van Cartier has uh, uh, sees her mobster boyfriend um, killing someone and so needs to hide out in witness protection style. Uh, so they hide her in uh, a San Francisco nunnery where she, you know, clashes with Maggie Smith, who plays Mother Superior. And while she's there, she um, revitalizes the convent, uh, attracts the attention of the public to support and revitalize the community uh, by taking over the choir because she was a performer in Reno. Uh, so she gets the attention of the Pope. There's a whole thing. Um, anyway, so that's Sister Act. Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit, uh, has the nuns going to her and saying, hey, we need help with this school that we are now teaching at um there's no money the kids are uh need inspiration we we need your help so she says fine i'll come i'll teach your music class it turns out you know there's all of this plot development but it ends up with the california state uh choir championships and sister mary clarence again uh leading the choir to spoiler alert victory has kept her past hidden and this is actually a major plot point and not to get too deep into sister act two back in the habit but 
in the first movie, like, they had the Pope coming. Like, this was a big deal. And then it shows her in the end credit, like, in the in the story proper, that she was on the cover of People magazine. Like, that she was not hiding at this point. They, 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 they dealt with the, the crime element. She could, like, live freely. People knew who she was. They had recordings. They made releases. She was a star. And then for Sister Act 2, back in The Habit, it's, it's like, oh, no. It's, it, she can't be found out. They can't discover she's not a real nun. They should know. They should know <laughs> this already. Anyway, this is all leading. I promise this is relevant. This is all leading. So there's these rumors flying around. The California Choir competition. Uh, one of the the student says, is it true you used to be a Las Vegas showgirl? And she says, I am not now, nor have I ever been a Las Vegas showgirl. I am a headliner. And then it's a freeze frame and the credits. Um, and I just love that. The I am a headliner is <laughs> the perfect line to go out on. That's good. Yeah. That would, uh, you know, looking back, going back to that final line from uh, Some Like It Hot, where it's written on the actor's tombstone, like that could be something Whoopi Goldberg uses on hers. I'm yeah. a headliner. So, of course, we like to stay positive on overdue fines, but this is the part probably most people are interested in, of course, is the negativity. Um, but we have to talk about disappointing film endings. A uh, friend of the show, Josh Carr, uh, shared this suggestion with us. While I have a lot of love for The Devil Wears Prada, uh, particularly the fashion... Uh, The ending was just not my thing. I didn't like the boyfriend. I didn't like how the Paris trip turned out. And it felt like the end uh, couple wasn't going to work out at all. I would have much preferred Andy stick with the magazine and perhaps take over for Miranda someday. That would feel much more satisfying. So I've never actually, big shock, I've never seen The Devil Wears Prada. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, I can understand maybe why that's a, that was a little disappointing to him uh caroline uh are which movies for you left you the most disappointed with the ending uh i mentioned the lord of the rings uh so that was definitely one for me i have talked previously on the show i did not care for the end to avengers endgame particularly the captain america part i do not think hit the end to his story was to go back and live in the past and um i have uh watched the movie subsequently and i find <laughs> that if i just shut it off before old steve comes back um it's a much better movie for me. I have a much p- more positive reaction and I'm just like the end and everything works out um, better for me. Yeah. It kind of looks like he morphs into like Joe Biden there when he uh, becomes old Steve Rogers. Yeah. It, it really is uncanny that, uh, <laughs> that piece. So yeah. Um, but then like with that, I've thought a lot about this, but like it, that movie had a lot, of pressure on the ending because it needed to not just wrap up the movie or the two part movie, but the whole kind of phase of those Marvel movies. So um, it, it's closer in many ways, I think to the TV show endings where we've talked about, you know, when you have something that's going on for years and years, how do you end that? How do you wrap that up in that same satisfying way versus a movie that might be, you know, an hour and a half or, uh, two hours and you're just kind of like oh okay that's all that's come before it so i respect that they had a big job to do i just <laughs> don't think they made the right choice but funny no one asked me on that <laughs> um the main one and this is um one a movie i saw in the theater that was like it was invented for this podcast remember me the movie that came out i meant to check the date it was like late 2010s or no early 2010s late 2000s 
starring Robert Pattinson and I saw it in the theater and it was one where you're just stunned. You need the end credits to recover. Have you seen Remember Me? Okay, so this is the movie that I hinted at like a couple minutes ago when I... So we just passed the anniversary of of the September 11th attacks. And Which I is saw the, not a non sequitur. That's right. <laughs> so somebody posted this ending to Twitter and then it sent me down this rabbit hole about the movie. Um, I will, Caroline, I will let you explain it, but it's ridiculous. So Robert Pattinson, uh, he... I don't even know like it, it's it's hard you you have to put it out of your mind when you're describing it because for 95 97 percent of the movie you're watching a story with um Robert Pattinson and Emily DeRaven who was uh Claire on Lost so uh she is the daughter of a uh, police officer in New York City. He has a troubled relationship with his father, who's played by Pierce Brosnan. And uh, uh, Robert Pattinson's character's brother had passed away. And so these characters are kind of brought together through their mutual trauma. But the police officer father has a problem with her dating this like troubled semi bad boy on this. He has a younger sister. It's all it's it's this kind of coming of age new adult kind of uh, peace around just kind of figuring out how you're going to live your life and making connections and being open to um to love I, I remember her uh thing is that she always eats dessert first because you know what if you don't get to dessert right like mm-hmm. it's that kind of approach to living like borderline yeah. of that free spirit but like with a heavy um history anyway last part of the movie uh people are finally kind of getting together making amends uh coming uh robert pattinson goes to visit his father it turns out he has turned over a new leaf taking the daughter the robert pattinson sister to school that day so he's not at work yet robert pattinson's like great i'll wait cuts to the sister um as the teacher writes the date on the board surprise it's september 11th 2001 turns out Pierce Brosnan works in the World Trade Center so Robert Pattinson waiting in his office as the shadow of a plane comes at the window and that's the end of the movie Uh, like I said I saw somebody posted just the ending to that movie on Twitter the other day and I obviously the day was horrible but just watching how just watching the ending, not knowing much else about the movie and then reading about the movie, I was laughing because it it just seemed so unnecessary and absolutely ridiculous. Like just uh like we talked about earlier. Hey, here's this gut punch or here's this twist ending. This has nothing really to do with what you watched, but let's throw in nine eleven on here. Yeah, and and so I just remember I had gone to see it with a friend because, you know, Robert Pattinson, this, like, drama, romantic drama that you were you were at. And the rest of the movie is, I mean, it wasn't bad. It wasn't the best movie I'd ever seen, but you're watching it, and it's like, oh, okay. And then that's the ending. Um, it was stunning. I was stunned. Yeah. Did people laugh at all or not really? It was probably just more of like a stunned silence. I think that's what I remember. Um, And like into the credits and then just like turning to my friend and going, what did we, (laughs) what was that? You know, and and not to say that, you know, obviously we mentioned uh, the twist ending can be done very well. There can also be, stories that are set on important historical days of of tragedy of war of of things this is not where like but no no it was <laughs> it i i haven't seen the movie since um it is available you can stream it on hoopla through epl i i came close i almost rewatched it for the podcast today i <laughs> wow 
uh like i said i've never seen the movie i've just watched the ending but now i kind of want to go watch watch the whole movie and just knowing what's about to come it hadn't hit the like it was it was trying to have it as a surprise it wasn't like it i can't i i I, say i meant to look up the date i can't do you have the date of when it was released I, and it wasn't it wouldn't have been that much longer but it didn't make a point like it wasn't sometimes you're watching a movie you know and and you find out you think it's modern day and then they reveal like no this was 30 years ago or something like that it was playing with that like you weren't really supposed to know that this was not taking place in the mod like in today quote unquote um yeah so i just looked it up and the movie came out in 2010 yeah, so you know, about a about a decade on, it's not that 2001 and 2010 were so vastly no. different as as places, but it was definitely keeping that secret close to its chest. Yeah, wow, I, and I'm sure too at the time when they were making it, and they were probably like, "Oh man, people are going to be blown away by this." We are so clever (laughs) what movie endings maybe didn't do it for you okay so this one i've talked about on the show before um it it made me angry like i cheryl and i left the theater and we're both like what did we do like what what the hell was that and that movie was jurassic park fallen kingdom uh, sorry, I should say Jurassic World Fallen, Fallen Kingdom, not Jurassic Park. So this is like the second movie in the Jurassic World trilogy. I am still, to this day, have not seen the third one. We talked about this very briefly in our Jurassic Park episode. So at the end of the movie, um, we have this we have this part where essentially, you know, our heroes, uh, Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard. They can essentially, all these dinosaurs have escaped and things are just about to get way worse than what they have been, you know, instead of it just being enclosed on, you know, the Jurassic World Island, um, basically dinosaurs could essentially get everywhere in the world and they have a chance to stop this, but they don't. And they essentially let all these dinosaurs just out into the world and who are you know, who are we to play God and let's just let these dinosaurs go. So in doing that, of course, then we have dinosaurs just basically taking over the world and probably killing off all of humanity. So it was just a very weird way to end the movie. And like I said, I have not watched the follow up because that the ending uh, to that movie made me so mad. But um, yeah, that for me was one where I was just like, this movie is awful. I and for the and up until then, I was actually wasn't. I was kind of enjoying the movie. So yeah, that's one where the ending totally ruined it for me. Uh, a couple of other examples, though. I am Legend. So the Will Smith movie uh, from uh, I think it was like two thousand and seven. Uh, if you're not familiar with the movie, uh, of course uh, it looks like Will Smith is kind of like the last man on earth. There's this plague that takes everybody out and he's a scientist and he's trying to find a cure for this uh disease and uh hopefully you know get rid of all these creatures basically it turns out though that there was actually people all along living in a thriving community just outside new york city where he is we have will smith die and he does end up getting the uh cure for this disease and he gets it to the community but it's more so kind of like you know he had these like he was sending out these radio signals and these people do eventually you know meet up with him but it was just kind of like i remember like really enjoy that was another one too where i really enjoyed the movie but then the ending was just kind of like oh this there was people there all along, and that's cool. They cured the disease, but our our hero just died. So, a little disappointing that way. I think that there's there are some there are just like there are many different ways to make a great ending. You can have a disappointing ending or a worst movie endings 
in many different ways. You can have the disappointing ones, the ones that don't pay off for what you've been through. There have been the the like the poor choice, which I think Josh what Josh is kind of referring to in the the Devil Wears Prada around you know someone picking the not making the best choice for them or Mm -hmm. you kind of want them to do something else or you know this the stunned like movie where it just kind of goes off a cliff at the end like remember me yeah i do have one more example and this is kind of a different pick and uh might be a surprising one so the movie ending itself is perfectly fine but what i have issues with is the end credits and i'm talking about the 1987 arnold schwarzenegger movie predator one of my all-time favorite like arnold schwarzenegger movies like if you're making a list of the best schwarzenegger movies predator is in your top five easily i don't care who you are what I take issue with is the end credits, though, which basically turn the movie into, it's like an 80s sitcom. So you can look up the end credits online because it'll, you know, we have the end come up and then the credits start and we see the whole cast. And uh, as uh, we see each cast member gets like their own shot and it's like. Arnold Schwarzenegger is Dutch. You know, he turns to the camera and then, you know, Jesse the Body Ventura and he turns to the camera and gives a smile and um, Carl Weathers turns to the camera and gives like a thumbs up. It's just, oh, it's a little I've cheesy. I think I've seen that one, yeah. Great movie. But the uh, the end credits kind of like take you out of it. It's very like 80s sitcom. Yeah, I think like that to me is an example. Maybe it sounds like an example of a movie that just like gets right close to the end and then just doesn't stick the landing, but like in a way that like also shoots itself in the foot. I don't know where I'm going with this metaphor of <laughs> a gymnast with a gun, but um, <laughs> it yeah, there's just a, a choice at the end and it's interesting because you know thinking about movies like with tv shows i guess um there's a lot of different hands in the project a lot of different eyes like who do you who do you think had the idea of you know let's let's end this experience with this cheesy 80s sitcom vibe yeah yeah it's it's an interesting way to end uh you know this over-the-top violent action movie for sure um actually this kind of reminds me i'll just go a little bit off script here caroline but um what how do you feel about the outtakes like the outtakes and comedies we don't get them nearly as much as we used to we used to see them like quite a bit like i think back to uh like the rush hour movies Anchorman yeah. had them as well. Um, I kind of miss the days of, obviously it only works for comedies. Like you're not having outtakes in like Schindler's List, but um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on the uh, outtakes during credits? Yeah, I think as long as it's clear, I think I'm okay with it. I'm the ones that I can't thought to uh, thought about are bring it on, which has um, both outtakes and like, cast singing like like which is also present in the sister act in both sister act movies <laughs> has like the cast singing and dancing and doing stuff so it's kind of that hybrid i think as long as there's a clear piece of the movie has ended mm-hmm. like with the movie itself is done and now you're watching a media product i don't know that i would want it to be going back and forth like having outtakes and then try to do like a post credit sequence yeah. that you, where you have to go back to accepting them as characters yeah. um again i think once they've chosen a path they need to stick with it yeah we i was thinking a lot of uh the jackie chan movies like i remember rumble in the bronx as well where the um yeah it just shows like jackie chan trying these stunts and of course he hurts himself but uh, i mean i should laugh but i mean it's it is interesting to to see that stuff and like you said as long as it's you know it's contained that it that it's the one movie then i think i think it's all good but uh i i kind of enjoy them for comedies it makes sense 
This is, and, and maybe I'm getting uh, ahead here. My next question to you will be about the best movie endings, the ones that are mm-hmm. your favorites. I have a fond. I like when there is like explanatory text of it, oh, yeah, which yeah. is kind of like the actual action of it has ended. But whether it's um, a character update or if it's based on a true story, um, then kind of breaking that and and uh explaining what happens like in aaron brockovich for example a lot of like legal or investigative stories will kind of say like um since this happened this has happened and i i like those those are those are neutral to positive for me almost always yeah i like those too for the like historical dramas and it's like it's kind of like, don't worry, you don't have to go to Wikipedia afterwards. Yeah. Here's what's happened to this person is still in jail or they got out or whatever. But uh, yeah, no, I agree. I, I like that too for, uh, for endings. I would agree with you there. Yeah. So uh, we're going to end today on this positive note, uh, talking about our favorites. Josh, a friend of the podcast who you mentioned, he also shared a suggestion with us for one of their favorite endings. The Spice World movie has the perfect ending. The goal is set up in the beginning, so many hijinks happen, and in the end, the goal is met. It's a fun poppy goal. Everyone gets what they deserve, and it's great to hear so many Spice Girls songs. They go on to say i also know this movie by heart and could probably perform the whole thing because it's all so good i realized that there were a lot a number of my uh movies that kind of come together to end in a big performance uh which is not that different actually from the big game you know thinking of like what is the movie building Two, I mentioned Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit, uh, Pitch Perfect, uh, another movie I rewatched recently, uh, kind of comes to the big performance at the end of it. And even though that's not technically, you know, the final scene or the last line of the movie, it's it's bringing all of the, the storyline tension to something that has stakes to it you know a contest a big game a performance so yeah definitely uh realized that's one of my favorite types uh what are some of your favorite movie endings you know i was looking at my i was creating my list last night and uh i've got some really dark ones on here actually that's <laughs> like great a, because <laughs> mine are really light so yeah, everybody gonna... comes together they're singing they're yeah. dancing kind of this big yeah. bollywood type ending i i love that so um for mine a couple uh that really stand out and this is the very first one i wrote down and this actually the ending to this movie is actually on if you google like worst movie endings this one pops up on both best and worst so it totally divides people uh caroline have you ever seen the movie the mist no so the mist is based on a stephen king novel um it's basically about of course since it's a stephen king novel it takes place in the northeast in maine and this mist rolls into this town and the movie basically it's like these aliens are kind of like taking over taking over the world uh, through this mist and basically we follow a group of people led by actor thomas jane they're stuck in a supermarket and basically anytime somebody tries to leave one of these like alien creatures kills them so i am not going to talk about the ending because i don't think enough people have possibly seen it and i really don't want to spoil it like this is one where i'm going to recommend people go check it out and you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it but i will warn you the ending to this movie is such a gut punch that like i remember um i remember renting this so this movie i think came out in like 2006 or 2007 this is when you could still go to blockbuster and rent stuff and uh i was just like my jaw was on the floor and i was just like oh my god that was like one of the most powerful and intense endings to a movie I've ever seen. So if you've seen it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
yeah so the mist it's just incredible and even to the apparently i haven't read the novel for it uh stephen king though has come out and said in an interview that the movie that the movie ending is better than how he ended his story so um even stephen king was himself was blown away and he's been very critical of some of uh, the movie adaptations of his work so uh if you haven't please go check out the mist and email us at podcast at epl.ca and let me know what you think of it because it's uh it's incredible caroline i want you to go check it out so um and you afterwards you may be like why did you put me through that that was horrible <laughs> Sticking with the theme of kind of darker endings, um, the first two Godfather movies um, have fantastic endings. Of course, we see at the the very first movie, um, we see Kay looking back at Michael Corleone, played by Al Pacino. And uh, Kay, of course, is played by Diane Keaton. And basically, we see kind of her being, or sorry, we see Michael being, conf- you know, all of his top kind of mafia advisors around him, calling him Godfather. And we see the office door close. And that's when Kay knows that kind of like the man she loved and she fell in, you know, the man that she fell in love with is not nearly the same person that she thought she was married to. So, um, yeah. It, very powerful ending uh part two as well uh of course we have uh michael ordering the hit on his own brother uh fredo and then also um we see basically you know michael sitting all by himself in the office and essentially everybody that he's ever loved or cared cared about really is dead or have abandoned him including uh you know his wife so um yeah first two godfathers amazing endings a little obviously you know you can't really end a movie like the godfather on a, on a happy note but uh you know that that's how that stuff goes another downer and i do have a positive one after this caroline i <laughs> promise you you can also very similar to the mist you cannot get more of a gut punch ending than seven um that was one too where you know of course you know look in the box and um you know it's with uh, brad brad pitt uh, kevin spacey morgan freeman and we learn of course i think everybody's seen it by now but of course we learn that um uh, brad pitt's uh, girlfriend or fiance i should say the mother or of his soon to be born child uh is dead and her head is essentially sitting in this box that uh, john doe has put in there so um the movie itself from david fincher it's it's dark it's ugly it's gritty and i don't think very similar to the godfather you can't end a movie like that on on a happy note like that wasn't going to end with you know john doe's character being put in handcuffs and let off to prison so um it's it's dark it's twisted but uh it's an ending that you'll never forget now as far as like the best ending some of the best endings go on more of a more of a positive note um how about the goonies uh the 1986 family movie of course all the kids all they want to do is stay in their in their uh town of course is being bought up by you know they want to turn the whole town really essentially into like a golf resort and uh, the kids of course they find all the p- pirate treasure and uh, they're on the beach they're, everybody's reunited with their family and they realize that they get to stay in their in their town and of course uh, sloth finds the, an ever loving family because he, now he'll get to live with chunk and his family so very heartwarming there um, and of course you know we talked about twist endings we have to mention the sixth sense like that was one came out in summer 1999 it looked like you know a typical thriller from the trailer and of course we find out after watching this movie for about an hour and a half or so that uh bruce willis's character has been dead the whole time and it's just mind-blowing once you get that revelation and i remember leaving the theater and just being like yeah but what about this scene and it's like maybe he wasn't talking to anybody there he was sitting sitting in a room with that person but yeah it's such a wow such a such a twist ending and i know it's been uh talked about to death but uh you can't have a list of best endings without uh including the success i think that's a that's such a great example of the twist ending that that has 
the groundwork has been laid for it and when you go back and you rewatch it because you uh, can't you're, you you want to rewatch it immediately or at least mm-hmm. i did the first time i had seen it and you go through and it's it does hang together it does make sense there aren't those the endings where I feel like impressed almost. Uh, I feel like the director, the the producer, whoever it involved knew they were in control of it. And mm. um, I think that that goes a long way. Uh, you mentioned David Fincher and seven. I think he is known for having very strong endings um, in his movie. Uh, Social network. is another one that comes up on uh, many best endings that, that kind of shot, after all that's happened after everything that's been played out and the millions of dollars around it that shot of um mark zuckerberg just sitting there hitting refresh waiting for the girl who got away to accept his friend request on Mm -hmm. facebook is is just like that's how you end that movie and and that singularity i think when in is there in strong movie endings where like once you see it it's like there, there's no other way this movie could have ended so uh, and actually i just thought of this when you mentioned kind of like you know the, those ones that kind of make you want to go back and watch it too uh, the usual suspects is another one too where you know once you find out like oh my god like that was kaiser soze the whole time and there's all these little hints and everything and uh yeah yeah just uh that's one where it's like the it's almost like known more for its ending than like you know the previous 90 minutes before it yeah i one that uh a lot of them are are thrillers or mystery or or things that kind of grab you and and shake you one that you're not really expecting is a movie that i rewatched for this podcast we don't have it in our collection which um Unfortunately, I'm not going to talk a lot about it today, but if you do come across it, I recommend checking out Down With Love, um, a early 2000s movie starring Reese Wither- or, uh, Renee Zellweger, getting my early 2000s actresses mixed up, <laughs> Renee Zellweger and Ewan McGregor. Um, it is How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, crossed with Austin Powers, crossed with Doris Day. It is um, a movie, it's set in 1962. Reese Wither, why am I keep doing this? Renee Zellweger. (laughs) Renee Zellweger. That's not the twist, by the way. It's not the (laughs) twist that you find out. It's actually been Reese Witherspoon the whole time. Renee Zellweger plays um, a feminist author who's just written the book Down With Love, telling women that they don't need to uh, find love, get married, have a family. Uh, they can, uh, you know, live life on their own terms and have it all. And as long as they don't get swept up in love. Ewan McGregor is, uh, how do they describe him? A ladies' man, man's man, man about town. Uh, he writes for a magazine and he, they've asked him to do a profile on her for the magazine and his playboy style. He's like, well, I'm going to show this, th- this, this woman a thing or two about love. I'm going to make her fall in love with me, expose her as a fraud. And then, it has a third act twist. I'm not going to go into it. Similar to The Mist, I don't think enough people have seen it. But if you have seen Down With Love, please email podcast at epl.ca. If you've seen Down With Love and The Mist, um, please, <laughs> please reach out to us. You might be our Venn diagram target listener. Yeah. I I, rem- I watched it for the first time when I lived in an all woman's residence at university we were in the common room and when we watched this unfold just like the reaction to it like people were just like what <laughs> like going incredible so i watched it again for the pod like recently um to kind of see how it all holds together it does um nice. and there's so much more to talk about so if you come across down with love highly recommend um that one uh, movie where 
it kind of plays with your expectations, uh, but leads to a really satisfying conclusion is my best friend's wedding starring Julia Roberts, a <laughs> nineties yeah. romantic comedy where she has made one of these things. I think it's 27, which is a weird age, but if she and her best friend are not married by the age of 27, um, they will marry each other. Um, he calls her. She's like, Oh, okay. This is, this is, we're going to get married. This is going to be it. Uh, he says, no, I've actually met someone and I'm going to get married to her. She turns jealous. She tries to break up the wedding, even though she's the maid of honor, like all of this stuff you think it's building towards her and the best friend realizing, yes, we've been in love with each other all along. No, he marries his fiance. They get married. They're happy. She's alone at the wedding reception. And it's the perfect ending for her. She doesn't belong with him. She doesn't make that choice of going with the wrong guy. So um, just a really satisfying ending that you're not totally expecting on that. Not a lot of romances end with the main character not getting the person. Yeah, no, like it would turn out that the fiance was like this horrible woman or something like that, or she was mean or whatever. But yeah, that's definitely, yeah. I, I saw that movie when it first came out, so I don't really remember it uh, too much. But uh, yeah, it's, it is kind of nice to hear that more of a realistic ending, I should say also uh, like perfect springboard to my next one which uh it was one where i was hoping that i wasn't i realism was playing a part in that and that's the end of get out the jordan peele movie mm -hmm. um when uh the main character at the end is like lying in the street and you see the police car and I, I just was like, oh no, oh no, oh no. Like, what is going to happen? Who is in this? Is this going to get worse? Like, is this help? Like, what is happening? And it was just... the, <laughs> And then the, the character who comes out of it in the end is like, it lets your adrenaline go down a, a little bit. So thought that um, movie really had a strong ending citizen kane i mean it's cliche i talk about it yes there are questions around how anyone heard kane's last words but the payoff of seeing rosebud at the end i think um outweighs that and then favorite movie endings uh i had to give points for inventiveness on this one but that's clue and having three oh, separate yeah. ones. Yeah. Um, and I think more movies should do that. Just throw all the endings at something and see what sticks. Yeah. And I love, too, that the, when it was in theaters, like, you would get a totally different ending so if you saw it in one city and then maybe went to you know next city over then they would maybe have a different print where the ending was totally different so such a cool idea yeah so there's lots of great movie endings out there we've shared some of our favorites um and yeah it's it's across genres you can have these strong solid endings it doesn't need to be a uh, prestige drama you can have mm. it in uh something like my best friend's wedding absolutely or sister act two back in the habit <laughs> all right so uh we're running out of time but caroline uh, let's do a couple quick round table questions so if you could change the ending to any film which one would it be and what would your new ending look like? I thought a lot about this one because I feel like I should have a lot of answers for this. Um, uh, and maybe I'll have to start keeping a list. But Pretty in Pink, I am going to change it. Not the part of who she ends up with. I know that there's um, that was famously decided by focus groups and, and everything. And there was a different original ending. I would stop her from cutting up the beautiful dress that she <laughs> ruins to make her 80s over the top, bare shoulder thing. The dress she cuts up is gorgeous, and I would stop that from happening. How about you? 
Uh, so for me, mine's just a very minor thing. Uh, so I would actually, I should have included this on my list of best endings. Uh, and that's uh, The Departed, the Martin Scorsese film. Um, so one, a couple things. First of all, I just want to quickly talk about the death of Leonardo DiCaprio's character. I think enough. To, I think everybody's seen that movie, so I can mention it. I saw that movie in the theater, and it's one of like those movie going experiences that I'll never forget. Because when that's like when he's shot in that elevator, the whole theater like there was this collective gasp. It was just like everybody was so shook that like it looked like everything was going to wrap up okay, and it didn't and everybody's just like oh my god like it was just so unexpected and yeah so that killing still happens in my ending for it but the part i want to talk about is the very very end where mark Wahlberg goes into matt damon's apartment and kind of takes revenge for the killing of leonardo dicaprio's character shoots him as he comes in his condo the part that i take issue with is the shot of the boston skyline and we see the rat run across the the window uh sill uh, we get it the it got so you know, close it got so close to sticking the ending there, there were like he was right there and it is such a is such an amazing movie like scorsese's done so many great movies and the departed is up there with one of the best but that stupid rat we get what it symbolizes like it's just so unnecessary you can still do that shot you know of the boston skyline and that's the way the movie ends like it was just like we get it like even ralph wiggum on the simpsons makes fun of that ending so um yeah that i would just remove that rat from that final scene from the departed I am right there with you. I also think that you feel about the rat the way I feel about old Steve Rogers. So yes. <laughs> totally. <laughs> but yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, and that is such an easy, like, oh yeah. And I get it. Probably somebody. I mean, how do you argue with Martin Scorsese, right? Like, if you're one of the producers or whatever, like. You just, you got to let him do his thing. So it's fine. Okay. So we talked about this at the beginning. We're in the fall now. So this is when kind of the year's big prestige movies are released. Uh, Maybe we'll be talking about one of these movies at the uh, end of the year in our best of the year episode. But which movie that is yet to be released this year are you most looking forward to watching, Caroline? I took a look at the calendar. I think something coming out December, maybe on or around Christmas. Uh, the new version of The Color Purple. Excited to mm. see um, what the response is to that. Yeah. A remake of the, I think it was the 85 uh, movie with directed by Steven Spielberg and starring Whippy Goldberg. So, uh, yeah, I, it's funny because I didn't know that there was a remake coming out. And uh, I just saw that in the calendar last night. Uh, mine, speaking of Martin Scorsese, is the new Martin Scorsese movie. Uh, it's going to be coming out uh, in select theaters, I believe, at the end of October. And that's uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, so it also stars Leonardo DiCaprio in it. And it's based on the uh, true story of how uh, members of the uh, Osage uh, uh, tribe in the U.S. were essentially killed off because of oil on their on their land so i know uh, we've got lots of copies of the book in our collection it was a huge bestseller a few years ago so um it's a book i haven't read but um yeah i've read about the story of it and uh, i'm really looking forward to watching it uh we hope you've enjoyed today's episode i know that bryce and i feel better now that we've shared some of our movie opinions and takes on these endings if you haven't done so we encourage you to subscribe so that you get all of our new episodes you can also leave us a review on apple podcasts and most importantly tell a friend about the show 
Yeah, and we'll have a link to everything that we talked about in today's show notes. And of course, we love to hear from our listeners. Uh, you can reach us on Twitter at epl.ca and use the hashtag EPL overdue fines. Or even better, you can email us at podcast at epl.ca and share your picks with Caroline and I and let us know uh, maybe what we got right this episode, what we got wrong, which movies did we forget to mention. There's already a few I know looking at my notes here that I didn't mention but uh share your picks with us and uh, we'll read them on our next episode thank you for listening and we'll see you next time